Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everybody. Today on the show, we have Dan Lawton. Dan Lawton is a mindfulness instructor and writer with a specific interest in the adverse effects of meditation practice. Dan is a certified instructor in mindfulness-based stress reduction through Brown University and spent four years teaching meditation in New Orleans. Dan spent a decade practicing meditation and completed roughly 15 silent retreats. He now mentors other meditators struggling with adverse experiences through the organization Cheetah House. Before teaching meditation, Dan worked as a newspaper reporter in California and Louisiana. He's written about his own adverse experiences from meditation. And you get to hear part two of my conversation with Dan now. One of my least favorite words uttered by therapists is the word resistance, because I think what that seems to do, first of all, it has judgment in it, but If someone is not opening up to something that you're saying, it could be because they're either not ready or it's not what they're needing. And there was a particular class that I went to where they were teaching mysticism and you were supposed to buy certain texts and the texts were written in an ancient language that also is not used anymore. And you're supposed to scan the text with your fingertips, not being able to understand the words, but that somehow the power of the different letters and the words would enter into your fingertips and go through your system and could keep you from getting sick from really anything that you didn't want to have happen to you. If it didn't work, it was because you had a blockage somewhere and they were going to offer you the way to unblock this blockage. And of course it was you need to take more classes and you need to do this more and you need to buy more texts and scan more and you need to be present and open. And like you're saying, they would use the word surrender. You need to surrender to this. I think that some people do need to be able to surrender to certain uh, certain things that they're kind of bucking up against that could be helpful to them. But I think if somebody is not open to something, first of all, there has to be some reason and that it shouldn't be demonized. It shouldn't be pathologized, but just understood. But I also think that, yeah, then it kind of sends the attention back around to the practitioner rather than the practice. And if the practice isn't really what that person needs, you want the person offering that practice to have either have that awareness or to not have the ego need to keep pushing their practice onto you. And so, right, there's so many things that can go wrong that just make you, at the end of the day, feel bad about yourself while you're trying to actually feel better. It ends up being an attribution error in some ways. Like instead of suggesting that there could be a deficiency in in the technique, there the suggestion is there's a deficiency in the technician, in the meditator, right? And, And I think one of the reasons for that is that, you know, these Buddhist ideas are, connected to truth claims about like the nature of the universe, right? And so they they can't be wrong in the sense that if they're wrong, then the doctrine starts to fall apart. You know, somebody who I work with a lot in the organization, one of the organizations I'm a part of is an organization called Cheetah House. And we specifically offer services to meditators who have had distressing and overwhelming experiences. Um, and this organization is run by a really uh, brilliant psychologist out of Brown University named Willby Britton. And she's done some really pioneering research, you know, on the adverse effects of meditation. I had the opportunity to watch her speak at a conference a year or two ago. And the conference was full with, you know, your usual kind of mixture of, of mindfulness enthusiasts and therapists and psychiatrists. It was out in California. It was in LA. And what I was aware of and what really emerged was how threatening some of her ideas and claims were to the mindfulness establishment. And you started to see actually a few examples of, you know, kind of very illustrious, you know, prestigious people sort of really lashing out because she was threatening something sacred, very sacred to them. And this is one of the strange ironies of of modern Buddhism is that it's often draped in this idea that it's not a religion, right? The sort of modern Buddhist movement seeks to distinguish itself 
from Christianity or Islam by saying that you don't have to believe anything here that doesn't match up with your experience. And in some way, that device in itself neutralizes dissent. It's kind of saying, you know, if you say something like, look, I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm definitely not trying to manipulate you, you know, just to let you know, right? And so it was really incredible to watch, you know, the reaction to some of her ideas, which were basically like, look, I think there's some real adverse effects to meditation. I think we need to talk about them. People were vicious. People were incredibly defensive. And I think the reason for that, I mean, there's a couple of reasons, right? I mean, people are always going to be defensive and lash out when you attack their faith, but there's no faith or religion, to my knowledge, that exists today in America or anywhere in the world that is intermingled with science and with medicine and with academia the same way that Buddhism has over the last 30 or 40 years. And so this is just not like threatening a religion, but this is threatening institutions and universities and, you know, places who are full of kind of mindfulness evangelists who have staked their whole career on the idea that mindfulness is a panacea and that it doesn't have negative effects. And when you start to reveal the fact that it does have negative effects, instead of having like an adult mature conversation where we can say, which I would say, that I think that mindfulness is tremendously effective for a lot of people. I think it's a great modality. I think a lot of people should try it. I definitely don't think it should work for everybody. And I think it has side effects like every, but everything else. Instead of saying that, right, the sort of pure category has to be upheld. And, you know, that's what I saw there and I've seen before. It's dispiriting in some way. And I think this was the place of, this was the most challenging thing for me emotionally was I was so convinced that I was like a, a rationalist and a secularist and, and that I wasn't somebody who was, you know, going to be kind of taken in by like any woo-woo. But the woo-woo actually was in the language of rationalism and secularism. Like I, I want to, I picked this quote out and I think it's really great. This is from the podcaster, Sam Harris, who, you know, has become an extraordinary advocate for mindfulness and very powerful podcast, right? Has his own meditation app. And uh, he said this the other day, he said, it is possible to be free and happy in almost any circumstance. He's talking about what meditation can do for you. He says, if you put me in solitary confinement, I know I can be happy. That is available to anyone. Now, I would make the claim that that, that, that is a statement that is more, relig more r ridiculous than the idea that like, if you're eating a wafer, that the body of Christ exists within it. I mean, that is an incredibly religious, devout claim that he's making. And this is someone who is widely regarded as like one of the champions of reason and of atheism, you know, in many intellectual circles, the most religious atheist in the world. So there's a lot of confusion, I think, because of the way that mindfulness and Buddhism has been able to frame itself as a religion that's exceptional, that is, that is fundamentally different. And Evan Thompson, the philosopher, has written a lot about this. There's an irony, I think, when even with this terminology that's used, that if you have a very kind of reactionary culture that's sort of woven into it, where people feel easily threatened, I hear almost like I hear someone yelling, mindfulness is perfect, damn it. You know, like, really, like you can have mindfulness in that sentence, you know, like really to go along with it has to be perfect because mindfulness, I would assume, isn't about achieving anything like close to perfection, whatever that means. I mean, it's sort of that's an amorphous term anyway, but that there's so much that's contrary to, I think, the whole reason for it and what it should be about. But you're right. People do feel very threatened when they want something to be seen as perfect, they then feel more validated if they can provide something that they can portray as being necessary in people's lives and almost magical. And so when you use the phrase having an adult conversation, I was thinking exactly that, that there's something regressive in the way people start to talk about things like this at times where they can't have a both and conversation. And when you don't operate in the gray, I actually think that that's not being very mindful <laughs> if I can define it in my own way. 
because mindfulness to me in, in that way is sort of a both and. I can be these different things. I it's about becoming aware of it and not having to be having having to think one way or the other way or that one way is right and one way is wrong. So right, I think a practice is only going to be as healthy as the person who teaches you that practice and guides you through that practice. And the same thing is a cult group. Look to the leadership, see who started the organization or see who's running it and then we'll know how safe and healthy the practices are within that organization. And I guess because it's so popularized now that you're going to have people all across the board, some healthy, some not, who are guiding people through this. And it would be good if you could tell uh, the listeners about what to watch out for also. So you know if these ideas, this teaching is being presented in a healthy way. I wanted also just to ask about Cheetah House again, because I'm glad you mentioned it. And I wanted to be able to let people know about it. Tell us a little bit about when it started and what it provides people were to be in touch. So, you know, if you go on the website of any major meditation retreat center today, and and I've looked at all of them, right? You're going to see pretty similar type of language describing meditation, you know, as a tool to make your well-being better, you know, to find deeper serenity, deeper peace, less stress. So I want to read to you, this is from Jack Hornfield's 1979 doctoral thesis, right? Jack Hornfield, arguably the most famous and influential Buddhist teacher in the U.S. right now. And he's describing the normal experience that people will have on meditation retreat centers. He says, unusual experiences, visual or auditory aberrations, hallucinations, unusual somatic experiences, and so are are the norm among practice meditation students. He describes things like heavy sadness, screaming mind trips, incredibly strong hate, violent crying, loss of body awareness, loss of perceptions of hands, body disappearing, the head detaching itself. You're never going to see this when you go to Spirit Rock, where Jack Hornfield teaches. Nobody's ever going to talk about this, right? But what Jack is saying in 1979 is not that this is just something that occasionally happens. This is the norm. This is the normal progression of meditators. And it's interesting because in 79, he's pushing back against the idea that this is pathology. He's saying this is a normal part of the spiritual practice. 40 years later, This has been completely obfuscated and hidden in a lot of places. So when I had this hellacious experience of my own that went on, you know, I was lucky enough to have already attended one of Willoughby Britton's conferences where she talked about a lot of people were having these like unfathomable negative experiences. They would sit in meditation retreat and they would leave and and then they would look at the red light and they wouldn't be able to grasp what red meant. They had lost that somehow. They would lose all sense of affect. They would become emotionally deadened and could no longer connect with their children. They would have involuntary convulsions, which I had for months on time. They would lose the ability to, and I experienced this as well, lose the ability to find the boundary between themselves and the rest of the world. I mean, this is this real irony, right? People talk about this sense of oneness as being the goal of spiritual practice. I can stay from my own lived experience. I've lost the boundary between me and the rest of the world not that great. It's great for five minutes, but it's not great when you have to go to the grocery store. It's not great when you have to get in your car and drive. So this has been happening for a long time. And Willoughby was really the first person to do kind of a landmark study along with her husband, Jared Lindahl. It's called the Varieties of Contemplative Experiences. I looked at a hundred meditators who had had these distressing experiences and sort of unpacked what they were and how they happened. And so This was kind of the genesis, as I understand it, for this organization, Cheetah House, which I'm now a part of. What we do is we provide support to people who have had distressing and impairing experiences on meditation retreats. And, you know, some of this stuff is really heartbreaking. You have people who maybe just got a recommendation from their therapist that they should do some meditation. They sit 10-day retreat and they end up in a psych hospital not sleeping for eight days. And so one of the things that Willoughby has found is that like the effect of this type of prolonged intensive concentration on the autonomic nervous system is really erratic and people can develop a sort of hyper arousal condition, which I developed and also frequent dissociation. And this actually shouldn't be surprising because some elements of this practice are inherently dissociative. If I ask you to become aware of your thoughts, your emotions and your sensations as separate things and to deconstruct the unification of that process, That's what's happening. And so 
I don't want to scare people and suggest that everybody who has this does practice is going to experience this. But one thing that you should know is that if you're going to go sit long meditation practices, there's a significant chance, according to Jack Cornfield, it'll be the norm that you'll have these types of experiences at some point. Now, most of the time, I think that they're going to go away, you know, but for some folks, they're not. They're going to continue into your day-to-day life. If people are sitting long retreats, anywhere from five days to a week or definitely longer, they should really know that this is a practice that's not meant for wellness. If your goal is wellness, I don't think that there's a lot of reliable evidence that you want to be into doing intensive meditation practice. And then when it comes to like just a basic meditation practice, then, you know, we find that the, the risk of adverse effects really goes down a lot. It's still there. And so there, it's really about looking at some of the risk factors. And so I think, you know, people who have had a lot of trauma, it's going to be harder for them to get into their body and they should go a lot slower and they should find a teacher who teaches some type of trauma-informed mindfulness. People who, you know, are suffering from substance abuse or inactive addiction, they also need to kind of really move in slowly. and ideally have support from somebody who knows what they're doing. But of course, like I say this knowing that like, it's just not really possible because a lot of people are just going to download an app. I mean, the things that I can say to watch out for is like, it's pretty simple. Like your meditation practice should be making you more functional in your life. So if you find that your body is convulsing involuntarily, if you're dissociating, if you start to feel more anxious, more agitated, woozy, you know, in a sort of brain fog, if your perceptions are altered in a way that feels bad, you should slow down on your practice. And then, yeah, Cheetah House is an organization that you can reach out to and we do both individual consultations and also support groups. And I'm really proud to be part of it because I can arguably say that like we've become the world's experts in this, in this specialty. And so heartwarming for me to have experiences of people coming in and describing things that they think they're totally alone with. They think whatever happened to them is so weird and bizarre. It couldn't have possibly happened to anyone else. And to have a group full of people saying, oh yeah, that happened to me too. And I got better. Yeah. The, oh yeah, that happened to me too. I mean, that's one of the reasons I like running support groups, being able to see all these sort of nodding heads. Like, mm, yep. Uh, when you thought you were the only one, it's so good to know that you're not. I mean, with however many billions of people there are on the planet, you're never the only one for anything, really. And so that's actually good to know. Unless you want to see yourself as ultimately more special than anyone else. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, that's also not possible. What I think is also good to go over is when things are done to an extreme, right? So that when, for example, I work a lot with uh, my colleagues and friends, Pat Ryan and Joe Kelly, and they were uh, both in uh, transcendental meditation. This is not to say that if you take a class, something bad will happen to you, but they got to the point where Pat talks about needing to be in a meditative state for 20 hours a day with his eyes closed. So, you know, that's going to create this fairly permanent dissociative place. And also, I think I, I can see it sometimes when people come to see me that they're there, but not there. Like they've come to talk to me and I can see in their eyes that they're suddenly not present. And they'll talk about how they've been involved in um, meditative practices that have made it hard for them to stay within the the world outside and to stay focused and to stay present. And it's very frustrating for them. And the kind of the sleep-wake space in between is where they're existing far too many hours of the day. And it's very hard um, to feel like they're kind of sleepwalking through their day at times. Are there any kind of predictors or precipitating factors? People going into this kind of practice, you know, do you find that if someone is suffering from something in particular, that then it's an indicator that things would not go so well for them if they got involved with some kind of meditative practice? Yeah, this is a really interesting question that we've been trying to suss out in Cheetah House. I'll tell you that, you know, from the 100 meditators that Willoughby Britton studied, she found a couple of things that were surprising. First off, a lot of them were meditation teachers themselves. And so, you know, this really pushes back against the idea that they were practicing incorrectly in some way. And a lot of them were highly educated. The percentage of people who identified as having trauma, I can't remember what it was, but it wasn't, it wasn't very high. It wasn't extremely high, you know? And so 
in the group that I'm in, though, I will say that there's a couple characteristics that are really sticking out in what we're seeing. One thing that we're seeing, I mean, I, I want to say like 90% of the people who come to cheat house groups are young men. Having got into meditation myself as a young man, I, I have some reasons about why that is. I mean, there's a sort of spiritual kind of warriorship that I think is offered via practice. And I think a lot of men, young men are looking for some type of ritualized experience to sort of prove themselves and, and where other cultural kind of markers of, of manhood are gone. This is sort of functioning as a stand-in. And so these practices are, they're taking them way too far. And I would see this a lot on retreats, you know, like I'd be talking to like my friends who are women and, and not to be stereotypical, but the practices were just a lot gentler and a lot more self-kind. And then I'm talking to a bunch of men who are really just like, you know, yeah, I'm going to sit this two month practice. I'm not going to, not going to move, you know, for two hours, like really trying to achieve and get something. And you can see this fusion between, I don't know, some form of kind of toxic masculinity and spiritual practice. So I think that that is a big risk factor for who this happens to. Yeah, other than that, you know, I mean, there's there's not a whole lot of things that we've seen. I mean, I think the other thing is just, yeah, frequency of practice and, and the intensive retreats. The type of practice that seems to create the worst effects are SN Goinka's 10-day Vipassana retreats. And that is because the teachers aren't very experienced and because it's so intense, you know, it's like really long meditation, a ton of body scan practices. So, I mean, maybe the other thing I'd want to add is like, if people do have negative effects, what we found in Cheetah House is that like trauma therapies, like somatic experiencing have been some of the best things to help people like re-regulate their nervous system. And so that type of work like was essential for me in recovering from this and really having to rebuild like my nervous system, which had been like really shattered in some ways. So just like we changed our, like in a lot of these intensive meditators, we've changed our brains in certain ways. You could get back. And for me, the irony was I spent 10 years trying to cultivate the highest levels of mindfulness that I possibly could. And I spent the last two years trying to be less mindful. I'm still deploying this quality of mindfulness a lot in my day-to-day -day experience, but it's become an asset in some way. It feels no longer that I'm serving my meditation practice, but that my practice is serving me. And that's been very powerful. I wanted to be able to ask you also just about how you do this differently now when you guide people in it, being mindful of the dangers of mindfulness. My teaching practice changed a ton during the pandemic. I just stopped teaching for a long time and I just sort of gently come back into it. So a few things that I've done differently, you know, one is, is to talk about this, you know, to talk about and normalize the fact that people may have negative experiences, to put it like on my website, you know, and also to speak about it. And also to use a few other ideas from like the trauma informed mindfulness movement. One is the sense of like always trying to give people agency and permission to stop meditating anytime they want, always telling them that like my instructions are optional and that they can always override them and do whatever they need to do. Encouraging them to also find different ways of practicing mindfulness, like maybe they want to, to move in some way. So not demanding kind of static positions for long periods of time. The other thing is giving people a lot of options in terms of anchors. So the breath, the body, but also anchors outside of the body, like sounds, you know, and generally, my philosophy has changed to be one that I would describe as person centric. And it's much less about me imposing a framework onto people, but trying to offer them as many tools as I possibly can, and then giving them some guardrails and encouraging them to figure it out. You know, that's just a real acknowledgement that I had to make, which a lot of people I, I learned from didn't make that I don't know what everyone else's internal experience is. And I, I can't, as the teacher, possibly glean from two or three minutes of you describing something, like the entirety of what's happening in your organism moment to moment and what you need to do. But what I can do is give you a host of techniques and a lot of psychoeducation and a deeper understanding of like your nervous system and how it works 
and, you know, and be available for you and just really supporting people when they want to do something that seems like it's pushing it out against the framework, you know, because people are so reluctant. Why? Everybody wants to always like obey the rules and do the same thing, you know? And so one of the things that I do often when, when I work with people and I pick this up from somebody else is like, I sit down, you know, even if it's on Zoom and I say this question, like, you know, like, are you comfortable with how far I'm sitting away from you? And they say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just a bit, but like, no, really think about it. Like if, cause if you're not like, in a, you know, it's, it's like, hey, I move back a little bit, you know, move forward a little bit, right? So I found that it's not enough just to like offer people options. You have to really emphasize that this is part of it. Part of it is figuring out what you need. It's really also been a humbling process of no longer holding myself out as some type of new age guru, which so many people do. And in some ways is painful and is traumatizing. Some of these experiences have been for me. I'm really happy they happened because the end game for a lot of meditation teachers is often building a personal brand around the supremacy of this practice. And once you're locked into that box, there's just a lot of things that you're not going to be able to see. And I think there's a possibility of doing real harm. Building a personal brand around the supremacy of that practice. That is such an important phrase. I want everyone to remember that place. place, place, place. Because I feel like in that way, right, it's the antithesis of how you're now doing it, where you're not making someone, as you're saying, fit into your mold. I find that the practitioners, the teachers, the leaders who are the most defensive uh, and most easily threatened are the ones who only know one way. Then their immediate go-to is if it's not working, that's on you. You're not doing it right because they don't have other techniques to pull from where they can say what you can say, which is, okay, then how about this? And how about that? Because as soon as you have a lot of different ingredients you can offer people to make this sort of recipe, then I think you don't get as defensive about that one way being challenged. And so I think it is good to, to learn different techniques just so you're open to people if it's not working for them. There's one more point I'd love to make too about this as well, is that I think the reason that it's very hard to get some type of presentation of person-centric mindfulness is because it's really hard to offer that product in mass, you know? And so like, you know, I sat a 30 day silent retreat. I mean, there's 80 people there and you get to talk to the teacher twice a week for 10 minutes and that's it. I think almost everyone would acknowledge it would be a lot better if you could talk to the teacher every day, but to do that, there would have to be a lot more teachers. And, you know, the curriculum that I was teaching mindfulness-based stress reduction, you know, it says that you can go up to 40 students in a class. It's way too many students. You know, I don't really like to go past 12 or 15, but of course, like the finances radically change when you go down to 12 or 15. And so, you know, this is another, I guess, this is a, it's a hard thing to, to work with. I mean, you know, it's, it's not like an enviable challenge because there's often a conflict between accessibility and quality here. Like we can have an app that everybody can access, you know, for affordable price, but they're not going to get good support. But everybody can't have a mindfulness coach, you know, that they're going to pay a bunch of money for. So it's a real challenge. Thank you for that. Right. Because I think, yes, things are at cross purposes here. So if people can make more money by having more people, then then they're not accessible individually to each person and being able to help guide them in a way that feels better or safer for them. What you also introduce into the setting is social contagion. And so then you have people responding all the same way because they think they're supposed to. And so then they're less attached to the self, I think. Yeah, I mean, and this is a, I started to notice this early on that anytime we would meditate and I would ask people how it goes, the first three people through the door are always like positive experiences. And then if I really like spend a lot of effort normalizing negative experiences, then somebody might say, you know, I had this kind of challenging thing happen. And then maybe you get a few more people, but you start to realize, yeah, the, the cascading effect and like the way social contagion works. And, and, you know, the other thing there, and this is something you talked about earlier is like when I'm teaching these offerings, especially in groups, there's a lot going on, right? Like there's a, there's a practice part, people are meditating. And then there's a psychoeducational part. 
And then there's a small group processing part and a large group processing part. It's hard to know really what's working and what's not working. And to me, one thing that I know is working is that, and the thing that I enjoy personally the most is that if you have a group of people and you get them in a, a space that feels safe, where they can feel like they can be themselves and be a little bit vulnerable and they can talk about the challenges that they face in their lives and the solutions that they come up with, it's almost always enriching for them. And they get a lot out of that. And sometimes I think that like whatever modality you tack onto that is just kind of like a cherry on top. I agree. And I also think the fact that you ask questions like, are are you comfortable with the distance between yourself and another person? And you really want to know, most people will just say, oh, it's fine because they want to be kind of (laughs) user-friendly and they, they also want to be liked by the teacher. But if you really say, I want to honor what you want, take a moment to think about what you want, then you have this very kind of empowered place that people get to remain in. And sometimes people will say to me, I don't know why, and I've mentioned this on the podcast before, I don't know why you might have a negative feeling about such and such teacher or such and such group, because I've never had a bad experience. Sometimes it it could be that they just are not going to have a bad experience, or it could be that they've never said no, or they've never said, I actually am not feeling the effects that you say I'm going to feel. They've never pushed back against sort of the perfection of that space or what the teacher needs to think that they're providing and needs to make sure that everyone is feeling. And so when they say, you know, this isn't kind of working for me, I wonder in that moment, going back to what people should watch out for, if they go up to a teacher and say, I'm just worse, not better. And the teacher says, you're not doing it right. What are the healthy responses that they should be looking for in a teacher to know then they're in a safe space? Yeah, this is a great question. To me, the first thing that I would look for is like, is the teacher like generally curious about the experience that you're having in some way? Because they should be, right? They should be sort of gathering information and really inquisitive and and want to know more about what's going on. But hopefully what they come back with is not just one answer about what you should do but a suite of options about things that might be possible for you and helpful for you. That's how you know you're in a good place. And the other thing that they may do sometimes, and this is a real sign of a good teacher, I think, ironically, is they'll say like, I don't really know what you should do. (laughs) Some of my, the moments where I've sort of been most proud of myself, for lack of a better description, is when I just was like, you know, I I don't know the answer to that. And, And because the risk of me imposing my idea on it is just far beyond me just saying like, I I may not know what to do. So yeah, I mean, a a sort of a flexibility, a real inquisitiveness and curiosity about your experience, you know, that the teacher is willing actually to learn from your experience in some way. And then a humility and a sense of honesty about what the teacher knows and doesn't know. I love that. I love the idea of kind of teacher as student and and saying, oh, that's a really great question. Actually, I'll look into that or maybe we can try things together. But right, having that humility is very important. Then you do know you're in a safe place because there are many people who have more of a narcissistic bent who would never dare say, I don't know. They, they just couldn't. They couldn't. And so then, you know, they're going to make something up. It's like someone, you know, you're asking someone directions. I'd much rather someone say, I have no idea what that is than to say, well, OK, I think if you take that, you like they're just going to waste your time because they feel like they have to have an answer. And of course, like all these things that I've, I'm saying, or maybe things that I do now, but definitely not things that I do in the past. And there's plenty of times that I've just totally messed this up and sort of imposed my ideas upon other people. And, and I think for me, it was a real opportunity as a teacher to not like beat myself up, but actually be pretty kind to myself and say, yeah, you know, like I'm in this learning process and I've become aware of some of the methods that I've been using weren't that helpful. And some of the reasons why I always felt like I had to have an answer for everything was sort of my own insecurity. And becoming more confident was just really being able to to kind of be there. I mean, there's a there's a very kind of, you know, these meditation groups, they have kind of a simpler, similar architecture, a lot of them. And so there's always moments where, you know, somebody asks a question and you can kind of see the teacher, the, the gears are grinding, like, how am I going to respond to this? You know, and there's like a moment or a pause. And I think those are the moments where I'm aware inside of me of like a number of choices. Like I've always got a couple of stock answers that always pop up somewhere on the side of my head, you know, like, but then there is the other way of engaging 
you know, which is the kind of courage to really have a live encounter with somebody in some way to really hear what they're saying and to sort of be willing to try to get it and get what they're talking about. And I mean, a lot of this, these conversations are really subtle. Like I encourage, I really encourage my students when they're reflecting on their meditation practice to feel comfortable saying things that really feel incoherent, to not have to say like this really profound thing, you know? And so we're kind of stumbling around in the dark together and just kind of taking stabs at what might or might not be there. And that's when it gets fun to me because that's when it, you know, as a teacher, you, you don't have this burden of being perfect or always having the answer. Instead, you know, you just kind of relax and be you. And that was the best advice that I ever got from somebody. It was just be Dan. And that's all I've ever done. And it's a great model as a teacher to also just be that you don't have to have all the answers. Thank you for speaking with me about this and teaching me and our listeners about how to look at this, that it's not all good, all bad. There's so many permutations all along this spectrum, but how to keep yourself safe along the way and what to watch out for. It's a good thing to to learn as people are trying to grow and trying to be more open, that that's when they're going to be more vulnerable. And so you want to know you're in a safe space with a safe teacher. And where can people find out about the work that you're doing or even the article that you wrote and, you know, Cheetah House, et cetera? My article, if you just, if you just search when Buddhism goes bad, it's going to come up right away. It, you know, it was really cool. It actually kind of caught onto one of these viral cascades and like 70,000 people read it. And so you can just Google it. It's going to pop up right away and you're, you're going to see it. My website is NOLA Mindfulness, NOLA like New Orleans, Louisiana. Dot com. That's very easy to find as well. And then, yeah, cheetahhouse.org. And there's a lot of resources on Cheetah House too, which really describe the neurobiology of some of these adverse experiences. And if you're somebody who's really interested in that, and we haven't dove deeply into that, but Willoughby has done an incredible job deconstructing and describing the neuroscience of what happens when somebody has say, a state of hyperarousal triggered by meditation. Yeah, those are a couple of resources. Also something that I would really recommend if you're interested in trauma-sensitive mindfulness is the work of David Trelevin. You can find him easily by Googling him. You know, he's got a whole kind of modules and classes. And I think, you know, if people are teaching mindfulness and they hear this and they think, you know, I want to make sure that I'm teaching in a safe way. That's a great resource. Yeah, and then I've gotten a lot out of Peter Levine's somatic experiencing stuff as, as well. So there's a lot of good stuff out there. And I think maybe the, the key theme is like being able to understand these practices, both in their kind of historical religious roots and also in their modern clinical manifestations. Beautiful. Okay. And I'll, I'll offer a link also to Willoughby's work so that people can peruse that more. Because yes, finding out more about the brain chemistry is, is so, so important. So people understand what's happening to themselves or to their loved ones. And also to be cautious, even if something is trendy, right? And we're hearing it everywhere, that it, it can still have an impact on you that you want to be aware of and you want to be kind of forewarned about. So thank you so much again. And thank you for all the work that you're doing and the insight that you've shared. It's really invaluable. You're welcome. I, you know, I appreciate you having on here and I really enjoyed the podcast also. So thanks for everything. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Good to talk to you. One more thing before you go. Thank you so much to Dan Lawton for continuing the conversation for us and with us. He is a wise man and he has a lot that he's been through and a lot that he's been wanting to share. And I'm so glad he's having a chance to do it. I find it so interesting that there are certain cultures, as Dan talks about, that feel easily threatened. The culture of mindfulness, the culture of meditative practice, the culture of a particular people, people also who want things to be pure, people who want to be able to have what they're involved in be seen as true and good and right in every way. But as most things in life are, they are not perfect. And it is okay 
to be entering into something that has some messiness to it. Because part of the reason that I'm doing this podcast is to be able to help people who step into messy situations see if they can find the good in it, but also notice what's not so good and take what works for them and be able to leave the rest. And that's how you make it a lot less messy. Things don't have to be perfect. And in fact, what does it mean to be perfect anyway when you're evaluating something called mindfulness? How do you know you've reached that state? It isn't necessarily a destination that's tangible, that's visible, where I know if I walk across the room and I get to the other wall, I have reached that wall and I can tell. With mindfulness, it's amorphous. It's invisible. So it's going to be different for everyone. And for some people, that's realistic. And for other people, that's messy and too messy. So people who want to get involved in something and have it be pure are going to have a very hard time when other people are criticizing parts of it or are saying, this just didn't work for me. And someone who is a mindfulness teacher or trainer who needs for you to believe in it 100% is going to push away your ability to doubt and is going to push away your ability to pick and choose, to choose again what speaks to you, what helps you, and to be able to leave what doesn't. But instead, there's very often the push to, quote unquote, surrender, as Dan talked about. And because of the work that I do, I have a very hard time when I hear that word, when people are taught to surrender. Because when you surrender, you're sometimes surrendering too much. You're surrendering your ability to have safeguards. And you're surrendering your ability to be on your guard or on top of your game to be able to notice if something's going awry. So I would much rather the word be open. Be open to it. See if it works. But to surrender? No. That's way too powerless. And it's also coming from a place where someone is telling you to do it so that you will then get help by it. But then if you feel like you have fully surrendered to something and it's still not working, as we talk about on the show, then the blame falls on you. You didn't surrender enough or you weren't feeling it in your heart. There was still some sort of karmic blockage and whatever explanation. So I think the only time you need to surrender is if you're robbing a bank and the police show up, or if you've kidnapped someone, surrender them. But for you, no. I think just like with people who are often told, as we also talked about, where they're told that they're having resistance, if they uphold any of their internal mechanisms of defense, but those are your safety nets. There are plenty of people who are very good at dismissing that and they get fully immersed. In fact, sometimes you see it with actors where they are method actors, where they embody the character. And for some of them, they talk about how wonderful it is to jump into the skin of this character. And for others, they talk about how disorienting it is, but that's the way they do their craft but they really lose themselves in the process. So it's not just in the world of mindfulness that this happens. Some people are more prone to it, and they also think that's the more authentic way to do it. But I'm saying I'm giving you permission, I guess, to not have to. To be able to kind of close one eye but leave the other one open? Until you know. Until you know this is right for you until you know that the practitioner you're working with is trustworthy, until you can see over time if it's helping you or if it's hurting you, if you're able to see too that if you need to make changes, if the person who's helping you with mindfulness training is someone who's willing to be flexible, who's willing to adapt what you're doing to fit you, then I think you can close both eyes for a little while. But know that your guardrail, your internalized mechanism of control still needs to be there. 
you can push it away for a while, but it still needs to be there just in case something goes wrong. And just in case you're not feeling as good as you wanted to. But also know that it's always the case that when you engage in something that again is invisible, you are the one who gets to decide if you've reached whatever it is you were hoping to reach. It's not for someone else to. So if you are deciding that you want to do something because you think it's going to make you happy, if someone else comes up to you and says, I think you've done it enough because I see that you're happy, they would have no way of knowing. Only you know that. So define for yourself what you want to get from it, what you're hoping to feel. And then if you're starting to feel that, then it's good. Then it's working. Don't wait for someone else to tell you when you've reached an invisible goal that puts all of the power in their hands. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.